morning, Michelle. Good morning. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first and you go last? Which one? I can go first. Okay. Are we starting now? As Please. soon as we get everybody in here. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Belinda, can you see like the waiting room? Do we have anyone else coming in or kind of slow down? She may not be able to see the waiting room in this mode. So I do show that it's nine o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. And thank you all for joining us this morning. I know that School has just recently gotten out and everyone's getting in the groove of summer. So I appreciate you taking your time to come back and visit with us and learn about the foster care system. My name is Suzanne Jones. I am the Safe Schools Coordinator here at the Division of Elementary and Secondary Education. And I've been hosting several of these um, just hour or two hour long webinars on a lot of different topics. And today I'm really glad to have with us Ms. Terry Harris and Ms. Michelle Duvall. They are part of the Children's Advocacy Alliance with um, and that works in Faulkner County in Central Arkansas. And so they're gonna share with us about the foster care process, kids in foster care, kind of the whole system, um, things that, that educators can know and benefit. We've also got a lot of community members on with us today. Uh, this was developed for educators, but a lot of parents, um, just concerned people in the community ask if they could join. So we've sent the link, link out pretty broad. Um, to that fact, if you need an, a certificate for attendance today, I'm gonna to put my email in the chat here in just a second and um, just send me an email if you um, didn't register. Like if you're, regist if you're a teacher and you're registered through ESC Works, I've got you, we'll handle the certificate. But if you're one of the community members or someone who uh, joined through the link without registering and you need a certificate, just send me an email and I'll be glad to get one for you. Um, to my educators, if there's several of y'all in the room, I know sometimes y'all uh, join together and watch on one screen. If the person whose name is on the screen, if you will just take the, the lead to send me an email and let me know who is in your room so I can give everyone credit. Um, also, I'll put in, I'm gonna put several things in the chat, but I will put a link to my mailing list. If you would like to sign up for that, you'll get an email a couple times a month letting you know the different sessions that we have posted. I'll also put in a link for my webpage that has them as well. And the last thing I will put in is a link to an evaluation for today. We'd love to hear your feedback, uh, not only for the presenters, I know they love hearing that information as well, but if you've got any uh, suggestions for topics or anything that can help me guide as we move forward and setting up these trainings for you. So, um, I think without further ado, we're ready to go today. I will turn it over to, I believe we decided Michelle is going to go first. So Michelle, do you need me to pull up uh, Terry's PowerPoint for this? Or are you kind of, are you going free form? I'm going free form because <laughs> I roll a little bit different. Um, my name is Michelle Duvall and I'm so happy to be here today. I am the prevention educator with the Children's Advocacy Alliance. As mentioned through Suzanne, our service areas are Faulkner County, Van Buren, Perry County, as well as Conway County. We also have a satellite office in Clinton, which opened, I believe, last year, perhaps, um, so we can service that area in Van Buren. I came officially on board in 2018. Uh, Prior to that, I served on the Woman of Inspiration Committee, which benefits the state chapter of the Children Advocacy Centers. I've been very fortunate enough to work with Danielle Sims at the uh, DHS office in Conway, where she and I have partnered together, where she keeps me a form of opportunity to work with the foster kids as well as the parents. The programs that I do with the children in particular, depending upon what their, their age is, if they're uh, pre-K or daycare age, like three to six perhaps, I read child abuse prevention books. And, that, and these books are designed to engage with the children so that they can understand what is being read to them. There's pictures and they, they just love when 
I tell them, Clara from the book, um, My Body Belongs to Me from My Head to My Toes, I say, this is Clara, and Clara looks like she's about your age. So I try to make situations like that relatable. I try to be fun, but I make sure when the book is over, we go over a few things. And that way they understand what is being talked about. When it gets to, let's say, kindergarten, no, I take that back, third grade to middle school, I do Empower Me, which is based upon the five body safety rules. I've changed a little bit of the dialogue to make sure that is current with what's going on in our world, such as social media. I, I include that so that they understand that you have to protect yourself even when you're engaging online. They also interact when I go through that uh, program and they have a takeaway. And that takeaway is my body belongs to me. So anytime that I have a chance to run into a student, whether it be at the grocery store or out and about, immediately when they say, hey, Miss Michelle, and, and I greet them, I say, hey, whose body is it? And they say, it's my body. So they understand that when I present that program, that the takeaway is that their body and that they deserve to be happy, they deserve to be protected. And if they feel uncomfortable, that they know who to go to, which is one of their five trusted adults. When it comes to the parents, we have two programs that I offer. The first one is Stewards of Children. It is a little bit lengthy. It can be very triggering. And then I also had a presentation that was designed by Casey Atwood, another um, staff member from the Northwest Arkansas CAC. And that PowerPoint is keeping our children safe. The difference between the two is that the PowerPoint is shorter and it is very up to date with current situations that impact parents as well as children. And then there's also additional resources that are included in that PowerPoint. So once they conclude that, of course they have you know, the liberty to ask questions. And I always make sure that they have the confidence that, hey, if you wanna to talk to me privately about a situation, we can, we, we can arrange that because I understand that for the new foster parents, this is something that they've never dealt with before. The children are coming from various situations. How do you handle that? And for the children in particular, depending upon where they originated from, they may have been abused in some form or fashion. And if that is the case, after I've gone through everything, you know, deep within my soul as a prevention educator, if they get placed in a situation where they are being abused of any kind, that they know who they can go to. Because the offender may be one of the parents. So after I tell them, hey, you need to at least have five people and if none of these people, you know, are able to help you, you think of some more. And they need to be someone who is older, not like their 12-year-old brother or 15-year-old uh, sister. It needs to be someone that can do something right away. And that if they tell that they have been abused, they know that they're not gonna get in trouble for telling. Because one of the things that I tell them is that we don't keep secrets because secrets can hurt us, secrets can get us in trouble. And there's a difference between a secret and a surprise. So that is, th those are one of the, the, the driving points that I do when it comes to the children and when it comes to the parents. And that is the end. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. That's really good information. I love what you were saying. I love that that comment about secrets are different than surprises. Surprises. That's, that's an awesome message for our kids to understand. 
Absolutely. And when I, and when I do that, I kind of lead up into like a scenario. I reference like a birthday party because a lot of kids understand if they're going to a surprise party, they, they keep it to themselves, but they eventually tell. And usually surprises are good, but with secrets, they can do all those things. And I, I love television. There was one situation where, um, and I'm not about to go off the deep end, but I, ha I have to say it's to, to order to, to make my point. There was a young gentleman who felt, he was a teenager, he, he just could not relate to his father. And his mother um, had some mutual friends where the mutual friend out of this group, there was one, committed suicide. Well, he started thinking, I, maybe, maybe he's not my father, this guy who, who has been my father in present all my life. And so he managed to do a DNA test and found out it wasn't his father. What the reality was, the mother had a relationship with the gentleman and that gentleman died in 9-11. And his current father happened to be a firefighter, which is how they met. And she was pregnant at the time. So when she had the boy, automatically she made her current husband his father, but they didn't tell him. And he was nearly about to kill himself because he didn't know what was going on. This man is not my father, then who is? But it, think about it, it all originated from keeping a secret. And had they just been up front, there would not have been a situation. And thankfully, one of the cast members jumped in to save this young boy's life because he was about to jump off the roof. So um, if you have any questions for Michelle, go ahead and put them in the, the Q&A. And I wanna ask a question. Um, we, we mentioned the Child, Children's Advocacy Alliance, which is a part of the child, Childhood Advocacy, no, Children's Advocacy Centers here in Arkansas. So that's kind of a bigger umbrella. The Children's Advocacy Alliance in Southern Central Arkansas kind of covers this region. So there are actually centers all around the state does each one have an education specialist like yourself that can go in and do these programs in the schools or do you? I'm, do not, quite, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. I know that um, depending upon, you know, budget and, and grants and fundraisers, I think the goal is to have a provincial person at each center. There are 17 centers total with two satellite offices, which one of us occupies. When I came into this position, it had not been created or it had just been created. No one ever had held this position where they uh, pursue bookings with schools, daycares, small organizations and things like that. So um, I believe after a meeting that we had in February, those in attendance, I think it was greater than 15. Some came from the same center, but I think ideally that there, there needs to be at least one because prevention is essential and it keeps the abuse from happening. Let's not wait until it happens to say, well, what, what, what could we done to prevent it? In some situations you can't, you know, but if the opportunity is out there to be educated, then it needs to be taken advantage of because it can happen to anybody. And is, um, it has been confirmed that most abuses come from someone that they know. It's not gonna be someone just driving about. That could be a whole trafficking situation. But when it comes to the actual abuse, it is with someone that they know. And so that comes along with, keep, you know, don't keep secrets. We keep our privates private. It's your body to always check first and feel confident enough that you know 
who to go to. And we do have a question in the chat for you. Um, she says she'd love more information on the books that you talked about. Okay, so I have a, a ton of them. I always start off with um, my body belongs to me from my head to my toes. And depending upon that audience, I can possibly bridge that into the Empower Me program. Um, one of the other books is um, Fred the Fox Shouts No. They love that one. The kids love that one because they get to scream, shout the word no several times through the book. So I have to have like momentum the day that is I'm going to have to read Fred the Fox because it, it requires a lot of energy. The other one is uh, Mouse's The Boss of His Body. That's a new one. Um, trying to think of some other ones. Oh, um, Do You Have a Secret? That's a good one. And the rest of them I, ha I have to look at because I have so many, but I, I go in rotation. I document, okay, so this is what I read with Kittyville. The next one I need to read is that. And then I use a tracking form. I'm kind of going to the administrative side, but I use a tracking form with signatures from the institution to, you know, who, who this is the person who authorizes. it. So if anything comes down to, you taught my child something, well, the school authorized it. That's a conversation y'all need to have. Great information. Um, yeah, but the person, the person who asked me that question, I can put my email address in the chat, and that way I can just um, look through all those books, and I can send a link or just put the titles. So I'll do that right now. And if you if you want to put that document to be, together. I'd be glad to to share it with everyone that's registered. You know, okay. kind of, that way everyone can get it. Um, and also, I can, if you don't mind, I'll put it up when we post the recording, so it's a resource there for people who watch in the future. Because those those sound really good. Okay. I did, I did put in the the chat a link to the CAC Centers of Central of Arkansas. So if you're statewide and you're looking for um, those resources in your local area, you could check with the CAC and see if there's um, a, a counterpart to Michelle in your area. And um, then I know those centers are there to help try to advocate for students and, and talk about prevention and also awareness of abuse, so. Okay, Ms. Perry, you're up. Let me pull up your PowerPoint. And if you want to introduce yourself while I'm doing that. Okay, hello, I'm Terry Harris. My current position is the teen special for CASA. CASA is a uh, children's, come on out. The CASA is the children's at appointed, uh, no it ain't. I can't even think of what CASA said, stand for. Court, appointed, court, court appointed special yeah, advocate. Court appointed special advocate. I'm sorry y'all, I'm nervous. <laughs> so CASA is court appointed special advocates. I'm the team specialist. Uh, before that, I was the transitional youth coordinator for DHS. And in that, I work with kids 14 to 21. I'm still basically working with children from 14 to 21. And the greatest part of that is the fact that I still get to see the, some of the same faces that I actually work with with DHS. I'm a big advocate of uh, education. Uh, I was a teacher, a pre-K a pre kindergarten teacher for about 23 years of my life. The way I got to working with uh, teens in foster care, um, I started working with um, the DYS, Department of Youth Services, and I was working in their education program. And a couple of the young men that was in that, in that program were actually in foster and when I got to talking to them and, you know, the first thing you ask about somebody is why they in there. And they was like, they didn't know they was in foster care. You know, they placed them there. Uh, and so that's when I said, wow. So I seen a need and I actually applied for a job and I actually got it. And I started working with uh, the uh, uh, 
Children's, uh, DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, and I ended up working with our youth, our teen youth, and it has been a joy for me. It's 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 a challenging, but it's also a joy to know that you can touch somebody. And um, you can start the top one. So we're going to get started. So when Susan asked me this, I was overjoyed because so she said, could you come and do an in-service? I was like, sure. And she was like, okay, these are some of the points that I wanted to bring awareness of the importance of confidentiality with you. It's easier with our young kids. When I say younger, I'm going to say uh, like the kindergarten to about fifth or sixth grade. It's easy to have the confidentiality. It's easy to uh, keep the kids uh, where they can because it's easy to watch those youth. But when we talking about kids from uh, junior high and senior high, because they are in DHS custody, even though it's that we, we try, DHS has a policy to have them live a normal life as possible. So when we have them living a normal life as possible, y'all already know what that means. They get a little cell phone. They can have social media. They can do all this stuff that, the, that you're supposed to have when you say so-called normal life. When I say normal, it's funny for me to say normal this time because we are living in such unnormal circumstances with COVID hit last year and everything is not what we perceive as normal anymore. But, you know, there's no definition for normal. But try is live like the kids at their age as possible. So when you got a high school kid that has cell phones and uh, which is different than when we was in school, when, well, when my first set of kids was in school than my last set of kids, because my first, they couldn't bring their cell phones to school. So my last couple of kids, mama, we have to take our cell phones to school because we need them to work. They, they want us to use them to work. So I had to call the teacher one day, like, y'all, they supposed to bring their cell phones to school? And they was like, yeah, they let them use the calculators or they let them Google stuff. So I was like, okay. So we got kids with these cell phones they're able to reach out to people that they're probably not supposed to reach out to. So they put a different look on what confidentiality is. The only thing that I can say is to um, try our best to keep an eye on them. Notice any changes in their behavior. Notice what they're doing. Notice if you see them like kind of like they uh when you have your children in the classroom, we have to look at everything when it comes down to our kids. And I know when we have a lot of kids in a lot of different classes, that's hard. But when you see these kids every day, you notice different things that, that they do that's not the norm. If they do something that's inconsistent to their regular routine, we have to pay attention to those little signs. The second thing is to bring awareness to warning signs to look the warning signs to look for our foster kids. And that's it. Um, it's not just foster kids. Um, when I was writing this and I started looking at this and I was like, wow, because I was reading something and they said for every one child that comes into foster care. And another reason why I, when I try to be as humble as I'm possible when I'm working with anybody when I'm working with my families. I used to work with mental health years ago. And so while I was working with mental health and seeing a lot of things that was going on, my first thought that came to my mind is we are all one phone call and one paycheck to being on the other side of the desk. So when I was thinking, thinking that right there, I have to, have to humble myself and look at the situation from all points of view. Because uh, even when I was teaching parenting classes, I thought about it. We are one phone call and one paycheck for being on the other side of the desk. And anything 2020 taught me was we are one phone call and one paycheck for being on the other side of the desk. And so um, my internet. So it's, it's hard. I'm sorry, y'all. But in, she said my internet's messing up. Is it good? Is it good now? Okay. I think it's just kind of freezing every once in a while. Um, okay. I, I will say to our panel, to our 
uh, attendees, if you want to turn on the transcript at the bottom, sometimes it keeps up a little bit better. So if there's a lag in the, the sound, you might be able to pick it up through the um, transcript. Just a tip. But go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, you know, so that's what we have to look. We have to look at the, uh, the, the other thing. Another thing, we have to put ourselves in other people's place. The importance of building rapport with our children. When I say it is very important to have such a, a, con a rapport with our kids, to, to know them, to build that kind of bond with them, to, you, to look beyond certain things that they're doing. And just, if you build a rapport, they won't have a problem and say, hey, somebody touched me. Somebody did this. Hey, I'm not happy this. This is going on in my home. You know, they won't have a problem with coming and telling a, a trusted adult that. And sometimes our teachers, because our kids, when school is in session, they probably will. Okay, you're frozen up on us again. So they're with our teachers for a long time, for uh, more, the majority of the day. So that teacher might be the difference in their life to make, to make their decision. To inform the things our foster kids are entitled to, I have a list and I'm going to upload, uh, I'm going to send that list to Susan, but I'm going to touch on that at the end of everything because our foster kids can do a lot of stuff that, you know, like if it's something that has to be paid for, DHS needs to needs to get that. Um, so that's the thing that we have to do and build. And when I say build a partnership is uh, know things that's outside of the school so that if you see a kid that needs something that we can attach that and go along and, and get it to the kids or refer that child to that situation. Okay, you can play the first video. It's a video I want to look to try to get an opening. Sometimes when you feel like you don't have any control in your life, you have to get a hold of the very few dreams you do have and make sure you don't let them go. I think the biggest challenge for me was the instability. Um, it was really hard to stay grounded and to be able to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. It was rough, very rough, um, especially moving schools, um, getting bullied a lot, um, like having parents that weren't yours pick you up, like a lot of judgmental kids or a lot of kids ask questions. School was really different because you weren't really labeled, you're just uh, like a student, like everyone's a student and I, I can do the best I could in school at home, no matter what I did, I felt like I wasn't good enough or um, whatever I did wasn't right. There were a few kids at school who knew my situation and for the people who were really supportive of me, that was okay, because I had someone to confide in and someone who could show me empathy and really be there for me, but there were other people who knew my situation and it felt like I was being bullied and that I was kind of being shamed for, for not having the same home life and things that a lot of kids at my school had. I moved about like five different times for school between elementary and high school. To me, moving schools was like kind of scary because it's like a new environment, new kids, and then you got to make friends all over again. And like growing up friends, they really are important in school. Like they, that's like the main part of going to school um, in elementary school. So it was pretty scary. I think in a way um, they wanted me to reach some level of success, just not the maximum. Um, I remember I was constantly being told, 
go to just take your GED. It's a lot easier for teen moms. It's what's convenient. Um, it'll help you out for now, but in a way, I was what they called stubborn because I insisted on in being in high school and getting my high school diploma. Actually, towards the end of my sophomore year, uh, I was doing pretty good in school as a new school is actually really hard um, compared to my other school. I was sent away to a different placement for like a month. Um, and that definitely took a huge chunk out of my school and I was month, like one month of school is like two months of homework. Um, and I thought I was gonna fall back behind and have to repeat the 10th grade. And luckily I finished, um, but it was very like traumatic, I guess you could say. I had an IUP. I was an IUP student, so it was really hard because some schools were really good with that IUP that I had. Some schools were very um, awful and didn't give me the attention that I needed. Um, so that's what I hated, especially like special ed, they call it. You know, a lot of kids get teased for that. Um, and I'm getting comfortable at one school with being special ed and then I go to another school and then I have to get bullied all over again because I'm a special ed student. My biggest supports to get me through school were my academic advisors. They were really supportive and helped me get the support and the support to Towards the end of high school, I just I didn't know how I was going to do it. Um, it just became so overwhelming. Um, I remember telling a few of my teachers, I just don't know. I don't have enough time. I'm going to be like the oldest one there. And when, when the time got close and I would be at school from 8 a.m., 7 a.m. in the morning until 8 or 9 p.m., sometimes I was just me and the people cleaning there. <laughs> I had a lot of support, so I didn't do this all alone. My teachers, my friends, um, my caseworkers, my GALs, my brother, uh, teammates, like little things here and there definitely they were my stepping stones to college so what I graduated from is an ROP it's a program so I had a lot of support in there that really pushed me to meet my goal um, I actually graduated with the 4.0 and I never thought I could do that I don't believe it yet that I'm a college graduate um, but it's really great because I never ever ever thought that I would be here I didn't think I would make it this far and to be able to say that I graduated from a university is um, very surreal. Walking across the stage and just seeing everybody and flashlights going and it just made me feel very important. It made me feel like I, I did it. Something I worked hard, so hard for, I just, I finally did it, you know? And I knew it was just the beginning. Education is probably the most important thing for anyone really, like not even just a foster kid, but since we don't have anything steady to grasp on, that's like their way out. No matter how hard school is and how overwhelming it is and how daunting and pointless it feels, keep going because it's worth it. Not only because you get to say that you have a degree, but because you get to feed a part of you that you didn't really know was there. definitely want I want them to be something in life I want to be something in life and when I see my kids being something in life and when I see myself successful I will understand that I my goal is accomplished and it'll just open up the door for bigger plans you're already successful by the way thank you Can everybody see me? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. I changed the devices. Hopefully that will help with the internet. <laughs> okay. So um, there's one, one thing that she said she wanted to be, she wanted to feel like 
she wants to do something. And that's the thing about our foster kids. They go through so much. They go from home to home to home to home to home. And they change placements. They change schools. And in that process, they lose a lot that they had because of the different traumas that they had. If any person have a trauma, it's hard for them to learn. So when you got a foster child that keeps moving from placement to placement to placement to placement, it's hard for them to learn. So just that regular high school diploma, when we could get a child to get that, that is a major milestone in their life because of when they do that, all that trauma, all that moving, they lose a lot. So when we have a new, when you get a new child from a different area in a different foster home, from you know in a different foster home, that child already lost so much. And when we get that, when we get there, we have to look at every part of that child's situation. Like one of them said that she had an IEP. When our kids get IEPs, yes, yeah, some of them get bullied and some of them get uh, talked about in school. Some of our foster kids already, they already have one strike against them because they are in foster care. They have another strike against them because they are in a new area. So when it comes down to education, they have to make new friends again. They have to make new connections again. They have to do all that again. All that affects our foster kids with their education all that affects them so when i was looking at uh a form and it says i woke myself up because we ain't got no alarm clock dug in my dirty clothes basket because we ain't nobody washed my uniform i brushed my teeth in the dark because the lights ain't on even got my baby sister ready because my mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. And then when I got to class, the teacher fussed because I ain't got no pencil. So when you're de dealing with that with our kids and they already, we don't know. I tell people all the time, when a kid come into foster care, we don't know everything that child has been through. We only know what the piece of paper say and a little bit that that child has disclosed to, to the workers. We don't know everything. We don't know every detail. We don't know every trauma. We don't know every situation that child has been through. So when, even before that child comes into foster care, they're facing a lot. They're carrying a lot of weight. Just being us as adults, you know, we have situations where something might be going on with, uh, I know one day I had plumbing issues. I had, um, I had plumbing issues. My kids had to be one. I had to take one child to the doctor. I had a lot of stuff going on, but I had to go to work. No matter what was going on at home, you have to go to work. So when you're facing all that as an adult, just think about our kids that don't have the defense mechanism, that don't have the management mechanisms in order to deal with everything that they're facing. They don't understand why their life's not out. They don't understand why mama couldn't get up to get them dressed this morning. They just know they have to do it. And they fight. Some of these kids, it's a real fight just to come to school every day. It's a fight. So when we take a foster child that has been taken away from the only people and the only love they know, it's that it's love in their house because like some kids don't understand what love is. So that's the only love they know when they're in, a, in that home. So when you're taking them away from the only people they know, the only love they know and putting them in a situation where they don't know with strangers, they place them with strangers. <laughs> They go to a different school with strangers and we expect them to be okay. And a lot of time it's not. Because a lot of time we not okay. We just pretend we okay. We know how to pretend as grown folks. We okay. <laughs> but as kids, they don't. And like I was telling people, when we dealing with children with certain behavior issues, 
we don't know. We 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 a lot of time look at the reaction and think it's the action, but it's really the reaction. We don't know what that initial action is. We looking at the reaction of everything that child has been through, all this acting out. We looking at that reaction. But we say, oh, Lord, that child is this, that child is that, that child is a behavior problem. But that's just the reaction of everything that child is dealing with. It's not the initial action. The action's probably been going because when we talk about our kids and we, and I hate the word resilience, you know, we didn't use that. Like, our kids are so resilient. They bounce back, they bounce back, they bounce back. But how much do you think a child can bounce back from? How much do they, how much do that child have to take to that rubber band break? And so everybody say that the child's like a rubber band, no matter how it's stretched, it bounces back, it bounces back. But guess what? Rubber bands do break sometimes, right? So when rubber bands break, that's that child's behavior. You know, that's the behavior that we look with when that when that rubber band breaks. So I was like, it's the, the next video that we're gonna look at is about it's a young man. And he talks about how when he first went into foster care, he had a lot of energy. He was optimistic. But when he seen that the things that he had went through, he changed. Would you go ahead and play Selvin? Before I click play, I want to answer one question that came up in the chat. Yes, okay. we will, we'll give the links to these um, YouTube videos. They're out on YouTube. Um, so it's okay. part of that information that I follow up with and send it send to the participants, I'll include the links for these videos as well. Okay. And this session is being recorded and will be posted on a website. You will get all that information of where to find it um, once everything's done. So that that was the question. The chat was how to find all the links. Okay. So now we'll go on with the the young gentleman. Mm -hmm. You couldn't show any weakness. You had to become a man very quickly. I was born and raised on the east side of Buffalo, New York. I'm one of eight children. I was raised in a single parent home. My mother raised me and my siblings by herself. My grandfather, he was never in my mother's life. And my grandmother, she battled with drug abuse. So she died at a very young age. My mother was forced to become a parent and an adult at a very young age. And uh, she, she juggled with that. And it was very difficult for her at first. My father was never really in my life. So my mom really had to manage and uh, raise eight children by herself. Growing up was very dysfunctional for me and my siblings. Uh, we were both physically and verbally abused. We would go to school and I, I would have bruises on my arms and teachers would notice that. And uh, before you know it, Child Protective Services was involved. I think I was about eight or nine when I first entered the system. Uh, that's foster care. And my siblings and I, we were all divided into different foster homes. I ended up being bounced around from different foster homes. I went in very optimistic and energetic and uh, happy. And then I became very introverted because I was constantly uh, being placed in a temporary position. Throughout my entire experience, I was in over 10 different foster homes. And it was hard for me to open up to people that I was only spending a short amount of time with. Um, I remember being 14 years old and my social worker, she came and got me from high school. And she told me she was taking me to some place for the weekend and that place was a detention center. I ended up spending three years of my life there. One misconception about people who are in foster care or are in detention centers is that it's the child's fault. Uh, everyone would ask me in the detention home, why was I there or what did I do or things that I need to work on, but it was really, you know, it should have been asking what our parents did or uh, how we felt. Uh, we were just treated as, uh, you know, numbers. And I believe that I was there so long because I didn't have anywhere else to go. I couldn't go back to live with my mom and I had nobody else to take me in. So I really just had to spend my teenage years there. The detention center, it was very bad. As soon as you come in there, you know, I got into fights. I got jumped. I had to hold my own. I fought, I cried and I held my pride. You couldn't show any weakness. You had to become a man very quickly. And I had to learn that at 14 years old. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I was discharged from this place and I immediately enrolled in public school at Lafayette High School where I was senior class vice president. Uh, I played sports like track and field and cross country as well as basketball and I was the first in my family to graduate high school. I then went on to attend Buffalo State University and I received a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. 
I am the first in my family to graduate and go to college. I am a living proof and living testament that just because you were in foster care does not mean you can't be somebody. I believe that you can be anything and anyone you want to be and you can achieve any amount of greatness as long as you can conceive it in your mind. I am doing all these things that I would have never imagined in a million years that I would be able to do. And uh, ultimately, my relationship with my mom has gotten way better over the years. We both have grown as people, and I am so proud of the woman she's become. Life is all about perspective. I blame my mother as a child uh, for being a bad parent, but I really understood that she didn't know how to be a parent at first. She just did what she could. All of my friends and my peers, uh, they can look at me and they've never realized or known what I've been through until now. I prevailed through it all and everything, it just really made me the man I am today. So when, when you hear that story and um, sometimes, as many times as I watch these videos, they still touch me in a different way because I know kids that end up in those situations. I know kids that has um, went through certain things and I know them and I know they fight. I know how hard they are fighting just to stay in public school, to do things in public schools and to get an education. And their struggle is different than the, uh, the regular child. Their struggle is different because they have all that. And uh, as some of y'all know with DHS, um, yeah, last year was COVID, it was changed. Kids could stay in care until they 22 years old. So we try to encourage our kids to stay in care until they 22 years old so they can get everything that they need. Our teachers that we use and with, and like I said, I have worked with some of the best teachers. I have to, I, I mean, I have worked with teachers that Hey, say, hey, I'm noticing this about this child. I'm noticing this about this child. And that's exactly what we, you know, we want. I know y'all got a lot of kids. I know it's a lot. But when we got a teacher that, that says, hey, something going on with this child, I'm not sure what it is. We, we, we love that. Because when even caseworkers and the CASA advocates, it's only so much that they can be there. It's only so much time that they can be there. And so when we got a teacher that has that extra eye or that extra feel or that extra, we need that and we love that and we appreciate y'all for that. We appreciate teachers for everything they do because like I said, I used to be one and I know that's one of the most underpaid <laughs> job that is in the world but it takes the heart and the passion of the teacher in order to do anything. So when it comes down to, cause I know a lot of our foster kids, I had one, he was 15 and he was still in the eighth grade. And that was a struggle. He wasn't in the eighth grade because nothing that he did. He was in the eighth grade because he was, when he had been into five different placements within three years. And each placement at a different school, each school, all schools are run different. I don't care what, you know, what people say. We, we might be in Arkansas, but all the schools are run different. And so at that school that he came from, they probably was at a different area than the next school. So he got frustrated and he kind of tried, he gave up a little bit. And so that push, pushed him farther behind. But it took one person to tell him, hey, you can't give up. You can't give up. Then I had one student that uh, even before she came into foster care, school was her safe haven. So she excelled at school. Honor students, honor classes, she excelled. When I say she excelled, she excelled. She did everything she could because school was the only thing that she had that stayed the same. She knew she got up every day. She went to school. She saw her teachers. She saw the same friends. No matter what was going on at home, she knew she had school. So school became her safe haven. She, school became her, you know, that was her place where she could be herself, 
That's the place where she went. She had her friends. She had this. This child came into care at the age of 16. So even though she came to care at 16, even though she was in a different placement, school was still her safe haven. That was where she excelled. She struggled when she went to college because guess what? College is different. College, you don't have nobody saying, hey, wake up, go to school. You do this. College, you have so much freedom. But when she got there, she kind of she 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 kind of freaked out because it was not the norm. It was not the structure that she was used to. Because school is a very structured organization. You know, they go for class. You got this time to do this, that time to do that. And it's very structured. So when you go to college, it's not that structured. You either go to class and get it or you don't get it at all. That's how college is. And so uh, that's the way she was. I can tell y'all about 10 different stories, but I'm not going to do that. But school is where kids, it needs to be a safe place for our kids. So when the, uh, when I have one to say, hey, this is going on to school, this is going on to school, because I don't have some, my, my teacher don't like me. So we went there and I, I went into a, a teacher conference one time when the little boy said, my teacher, she just don't like me. She don't do this. She won't do that. So I went up there and I said, come on, let's go talk. He was like, I don't want you to go with that. I said, yeah, we finna go and talk to your teacher. So when we had the conversation with the teacher, it wasn't that she didn't like him. It was the fact that he wasn't giving her a chance. He wasn't opening up and he wasn't letting her. She, he was being snappy on his end. So when we broke that barrier down, they had a good relationship and it was able to move on. So some things that our kids, when they in foster care, they always they already have a pre, um, they already got a guard up and they already got everything up against the adults. It's not, it's not the teachers. So our kids sometimes already build a bridge. They already got that wall built up because they feel like they cannot trust adults. And when I tell you teachers that y'all are more constant than you leave, and when you got a child in foster care, they might go through three different caseworkers during their time in foster care, maybe four, maybe five. That's how the turnover is in foster care. So when, uh, are we back on? Yeah. So when, uh, when we got the teacher, when we got our teachers right here and they see you every day, you probably the most constant thing in that child's life. So when, because when they, every time somebody, let me introduce myself, I'm your new caseworker. Next three months, let me introduce myself, I'm your new caseworker. So when they come to school and see you every day, you probably the most constant face because they see your face every day. They see that smile every day. They see that touch every day and they count on that. So some of my kids, whether they struggling in school or not, they enjoy coming to school because of the fact they get to see the same people every day. Now it's hard for those to have to move from this place to that place and that place because that breaks them down as well. Any change when you got a child life, and a lot of people say that between the ages of 15 or 17 is different. No, it's not. All children need the same constant in their life. And so when that's breaking up and broken down, that affects their education. So when it comes down to when we have some people that say, uh, you know, a lot of kids don't want to get tested, want to feel like they in special ed or need an IEP. I love Arkansas with the specified learning disability on the IEP. It's not saying that this is not saying that that is just saying this child needs a little help to catch up. So when we got those, and, and it's nothing wrong with a child having to have a IEP, a guideline to help them stay on task to keep them where they need to be in order to achieve their high school diploma. Because a lot of kids don't think that they're ever, a lot of kids don't even know what tomorrow holds. So they do not know if they're going to ever see a high school diploma. That high school diploma is so far away for some kids to we we have to have a big partnership to help get to them steps of getting that high school diploma. Because sometimes when I used to do a planning meeting and we asked the child, 
tell me about your plans. Tell me what you want to do for the future. Someone shrugs their shoulders up and say, I don't know. Yeah, you know, because I remember when my kids were little, I have, I'm a mother of six. So when my kids was little, they used to say, I'm going to be a firefighter. I want to be a policeman. I want to be this. But when we got foster kids that's done lost to all that, and you ask them, tell me what you want to be when you grow up, they don't know. Because they don't even know, some of them don't even know if they're going to be in the same place, if they're going to be sleeping in the same bed tomorrow, let alone what they want to be when they grow up. So it's hard for them to even conceive and just to go from one grade to another one, because I remember when I had one that was it had graduated from the eighth grade, that little boy cried because he didn't think he was ever going to be able to do that. He graduated from the eighth grade and he had to go to high school. They don't think that they can do that. So we have to put this back into them. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you have been through, guess what? You can still achieve this. We have to put them rubber bands back in. We and sometimes I remember uh my mama, it was a rubber band, my rubber band were broke. My mama took the time to tie the knot in the rubber band. Sometimes we have to take that time to tie that knot in that rubber band to put that child back together again. So it's not that it's not that we as teachers, we know how burdened y'all are. We know that. Believe me, I know. So when we take the time, but it takes an extra eye. So often, this is a picture I have, says so often children are punished for being human. Children are not allowed to have grumpy moods, bad days, disrespectful tones, or bad attitudes. Yet we adults have them all the time. We think if we don't nip it in the bud, it will escalate and we will lose control. Let go of that unfound fear and give your child permission to be human. We all have days that none of us are perfect and we must stop holding our kids to a higher standard of perfection than we can attain ourselves. All the punishments that you could throw at them won't stamp out the humanity for to err is human and we all do. So when we look at kids and like some kids, it's okay to throw a temper tantrum. It's okay to do that because we as adults, we have temper tantrums. It might not look like our kids' temper tantrums, but we have them. You know, we have days that nothing goes right and you like, oh my goodness, how are you running around the house looking right? <laughs> you know, I couldn't find my kids one day and I had to be somewhere. I'm running around the house looking and all I had to do was move a piece of paper on my bed because I had laid this piece of paper on top of my keys and I was looking, I done tore up everything looking for my keys, ran out to the car and all I had to do was move a piece of paper to find my keys. And so that's what our kids sometimes when they don't have that pencil and they already know because they already know, oh, I'm going to get my name on the board because I don't have all my materials I need. And it might be something as that, and it might be something as, as simple as that to trigger our kids. But uh, just the simplest thing saying, it's okay not to have your pencil today. We have extra here. You know, that, that little simple thing can make a whole difference in a child's life. Just to smile, and you, a lot of people think that a smile is hard to do. Just think of when you, all you've seen is frown, all you've seen is yelling, and all you've seen is that. And that child has to go through that. And he see that one smile when he walked through that door at 7.45 in the morning from that teacher. That's the brighten that whole child's life up because he see that friendly face. And when we do it, when we do that, our kids are so when I say kids, yes, I deal with teens, and yes, they can be difficult. But I love it. You know, I have been cussed out by teenagers. You just like everybody as you do this and they cuss me out. Then I say, get through cussing. I say, okay, you through? Can we move on? And they look at me like, you mean you ain't going to say nothing? Mm -mm. Go ahead. I say, yeah, if you need to cuss them out, cuss them out. 
But when you get through, I need you to apologize and I don't need you to use your cuss words, but I need you to get them all out now. And they look at me kind of strange and they like, okay. So some of our kids, they need that outlet, you know? And if they see uh, you teach us every day and y'all there every day, and they know you got your job and you're not going to quit your job every day. Yes, you become their punching bag sometimes. You become the person that they take their anger out on sometimes. But we we know we have to control our children. They have to do that. But sometimes it's, it's, it's just that reaction to the action that we didn't see. And they don't have nobody else to take it out on. On this next slide, let's go to the next one. It says... Uh, It's the next side says, we have to see beyond the surface. It's called compassion. And I was trying to my best to think of a definition for what compassion was. And other than what Western Dictionary say. And I was thinking, I was like, we have to see beyond, beyond the surface. Cause we all put on facades and we all have put on facades and we all have hidden things. So kids have now like, we have had kids that grow up in households. So I'm thinking about our households and especially being from the African-American race. The one thing that we know is you don't talk about what goes on in your house. So what goes on in your house, you don't say nothing about what nothing. Don't, you know, what goes on in this house, stay in this house. So these kids holding a whole lot of secrets. Some of them holding some big secrets that they not said. So sometimes we have to see beyond the surface we have to hear beyond the words the kids might say i'm fine but have a tear rolling down their face they might say i'm good but they come in dirty they might say i'm all right but they starving to death so we have to we have to we have to hear beyond the words we have to understand the silence Sometimes a child come in and you know this was an active child, but now this child has withdrew and got inside himself and he doesn't open his mouth or say anything hardly to anybody anymore. We have uh, a child that you see him hiding stuff in the classroom. I done had kids that tried to, um, when I was in the classroom, it was this one little boy that tried to sneak his snacks out every day. He would eat and ask for an extra one and that one he had to put in his backpack because he wanted to take it home to his little brother because he knew he there was it was limited food in the house. So even we have to watch their actions and just not they, you know, we have to understand the silence. We have to understand the sneakiness sometimes what kids do because sometimes it's not bad. Sometimes they're not trying to steal. Sometimes they're not doing that. Sometimes they're trying to take care of somebody else that's in the household. And then we have to teach beyond the noise. We, and when we say teach beyond the noise, it's a lot of stuff to go on in kids' heads that's dealing with stuff, whether they in foster care or not, uh, or somebody that was overlooked to go in foster care. They got a lot of noise going on in their head. Little kids worry the most about their parents than anything that I have ever seen. When I say that, when you got a small child and I've had kids and they was like, where is mama sleeping at? And I have kids that say, where, where is my mama? If I'm staying here, where is my mama sleeping at? Where is her head? Where? How, how is she doing this? And so when we do that, we have to look at all the situations because we don't know what's going through our kids' head. And we think they looking out the window in the fall. And you know the kids, because I used to be a big daydreamer when I was in school. I pro if I was in school when back then, when I was in school, we didn't have the ADD and all that stuff that they diagnosed with now but I know that today's time as fast as school going I probably will be a big problem child because I used to daydream all the time I could be still in my seat but 
that was just me. But we had to, we got a chance to go outside and play a little bit longer than these kids do today. <laughs> we got we we got about 30 minutes to play outside back then. But it's like uh we have to look beyond the noise because the kids worry a lot. These kids see more than we did when we were kids, they hear more than we did when we was kids, they live a life that I wouldn't even think about when I was a kid because they, you know, because some of the things that kids say to me, I have to, I open my eyes like, where did you get that from? Because these kids are, they, they more advanced than what we were. So we have to look in those situations and say, hey, so that's why we have to learn how to teach beyond the noise. And so that is what compassion is. We have to give so much compassion especially to foster kids and especially to the ones that we don't know if they in foster care you know we don't know if they need to go in foster care a lot you know and here's the time for that next video the last one come here now I told you, you'd never come back to me that way, ever. Stop it! When you know something's wrong, it's easy to look the other way. I'm Sharon with the Department of Child Services. I'm here to pick up Katie. But if you pay attention to a problem long enough, sometimes you become part of the solution. Don't look away. After that experience, I learned that hundreds of kids in my community were being placed in foster care and the system was overwhelmed. I couldn't be a foster parent, but I knew I had to do something. So before we close our final session today, I want to remind you that you might be the most consistent person in the life of the child you're assigned to. Your job is to become as familiar as possible with their circumstances so you can make recommendations to the court regarding what's best for them. And so Did I feel prepared? No. But when a kid is taken away from his home and his family, he isn't prepared either. From my position, I could see all sides of foster care. When are you gonna grow up? Don't just sit there. You could have been around. You can't take care of her own kids. I saw families that were broken. You're hurting me. I saw foster parents struggling to create a sense of safety and love in a minefield of emotional injuries. He pulled him out, he looked at him, got real quiet, and slammed him on the table and ran out. He's, he's very upset. I mean, um, I don't know what happened. He, he just changed suddenly. And, and we were very concerned. I mean, he wouldn't speak to us about it. We, we, we didn't know why he was so upset about getting a new pair of shoes. And I saw a boy who had everything taken from him. I wanted to go home. My mom is not a bad person. 
To a lot of people, he must have seemed like a bad kid. But after a few short months, I had come to understand that he was mostly scared. What do you think? I'm not an expert, but one thing I quickly learned is that violence leaves wounds on more than just your body, and those wounds can be both a symptom and a cause. That sometimes the people who cause the most damage are the ones who have been hurt the most. In situations like that, it's hard to know what's best. Thank you, Ms. Williams, for that report and for volunteering your time for this case. Based on the testimony of Ms. Williams and of other witnesses we've heard from today, the court finds it best that Dylan remain in the temporary care of Mr. and Mrs. Stevenson until such time as the circumstances of his home prove to be suitable for children. It's hard when the problem is overwhelming and you feel you have no solution to offer. It's hard to stick with it. But these last few months have taught me that when the problem is bigger than I am, the solution is to. Yeah, so in this one right here, it was two points I wanted to bring out in this one particular. One is it's so easy to turn an eye to a situation when we know when we know something is wrong and we we turn our eye to it and hope and pray the best come out of the situation. And I know as teachers, we still see a lot and we pray that it's not what we think it is. But it's safer to call that hotline number and be more safe than sorry. You know, uh, Arkansas has had, in the last few years, had a lot of child deaths, had a lot of uh, things that happened to kids. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm in for every, every child. You know, we got to, uh, we are all mandated reporters so we all need to take that job serious, that part of our job very seriously because we don't know what's going on in certain households. So when we have that right there, we have to step up and and we have to make, sometimes we have to make them calls. In my year, and while I was teaching, I made 15 calls. Now the 15 calls I made, 10 what became they were removed from the home and five of them became PS cases. So every call I made was very, you know, what was uh, taken seriously. Every call I made was, a case came out of every call that I made. Ms. Now, in my, yes. Would you tell them what PS cases are in case they don't know? It's just um, a PS case is where the child stays in the home and the caseworker go out and they try to get them the services that they need in order to improve. Now we have the, we have the court cases and the uh, the preventative service cases. That's what PS preventative service cases mean that they don't give the services that they need in order to uh, not go in care because they we our foster care system in Arkansas alone. We have over 5,000 kids in care in Arkansas, but we only have like 1,500 foster homes. And what happened was in 2019, the laws changed. So a lot of our group homes got shut down. So now it's very difficult. So when you see a caseworker that says they had to spend a night in the uh they had to spend a night in dhs office it's because it's hard to place kids and especially if it's teen kids it's hard to place our children and the it's uh it 
we hate to see kids come into care. So with the preventive service cases, we try to they try to do everything they can to keep that child from coming into care. They try to, if they need, hey, if we can find certain, even if they can find grandma to take the kids while mama get better, we try to do that. But the preventative service cases is like, or offense cases, because I know y'all teacher know what offense case is, family needs and services. So when we have our offense cases and our preventative service cases is to keep the children in the home, it's to provide services to keep the kids in the home. I done had, we done had, uh, I guess since 2020 and now happened, we done had more education neglect cases come through because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. You know, they say, hey, I'm going to, I don't want to send my kid to school, so I'm going to do this. And then the teacher's like, hey, this teacher, this kid is not showing up for Zoom. You know, this kid is not showing up for Zoom. But mom's going to work every day. Tell him what she might wake the child up, make sure he brushes his teeth, wash his face to be shiny for Zoom. But that baby get back in the bed when mama walk out the door and locks that door. <laughs> so, you know, it's like this whole situation for 2020 has caused our, caused a lot of stuff that we have to look at. And I remember getting an email from our, the Conway Public Schools that said there will be no more <laughs> virtual classes this year. Everybody will be on campus. And I kind of chuckled because I know the reason why. Because it was a struggle trying to get the kids to sign on the Zoom. Because guess what? Mama, some, mama, have, mama and daddy have to go to work. So this kid on his own, this kid probably not showing up for class. But yes, we done had a, a lot of education neglect cases within a year or so. But, and we had, um, I came from Northeast Arkansas. And the more, when, the, when I say fence cases, the fence cases that I had was kids skipping school. And what upset me most about the fence case is why did we wait till this child missed 500 days of school before we turned it over to get help? You know, that's the crazy part about me. But to me, it should be, hey, if this child missed five days and don't have a doctor's excuse, somebody needs to be contacted. Because school is very important. It might be a situation. It might be a reason. It might be something that's going on, the reason why this child is missing days. Now, if this child has an illness that caused them to miss so many days, I'm sure they got the documentation for that. But most kids, you know, when they get to teenage, which the ones I work with, we need to figure out, hey, if this mom's sending this child out the door and you're not making it to school, we need to figure out why. And the school systems, you know, like the school started sending, this is why I can't understand with parents because I got, a, I got even when I knew my kid was missing, I got a recording of your child did not come to school today. We just making sure that you was aware that your child not, we got a recording to that. So I was like, why these parents ain't getting these recorded messages to figure out why their kid ain't in school? So, you know, it is a breakdown somewhere, but we got to figure out what it is. Some helpful t hints that I'm trying to see. I would I would like it is again, pay attention, pay attention to you, pay attention to the kids, pay attention to everything, uh, especially our high school kids, because like I said, they have resources to call somebody to come pick them up from campus. I've seen that so much. <laughs> in the last few years they call somebody to come pick them up and when they call somebody to come pick them up nine times out of ten that's not a person who's supposed to be coming to pick their child up because if they can't come in the office and sign you out they're not supposed to have you. so and that's one biggest thing for our foster kids we had a couple girls here in in the foster county area that were good with contacting people that they were not supposed to be with and having them to come pick them up on campus. And with those, uh, they came, you know, they came to a bit, you know, one of them ended up leaving care time. She turned 18 because she thought that was a better situation. Thank God she was able to come back into care after she seen that wasn't the life she wanted to live that was out there. She figured out foster care was a good situation. 
And one thing, if y'all have kids that are in foster care that are age 16, 17, 18, if y'all help DHS and CASA be an advocate for these kids to stay in care so they can get everything they need, everything they deserve, you know, there are benefits. They get, they get a monthly stipend. They get education vouchers. They get job opportunities. They get different things that they're allowed to stay in care. You know, we help pay, you know, it's not, DHS don't help, but it's an education training voucher that if you are even in care only a week that you qualify for. If they come in care a week before their 18th birthday, they get this extra $2,500 a semester to help them pay for their education. Plus they get the foster care Pell Grant. That's a lot of things that they get. Now on the kids from 14 through 17 or even younger in school, if y'all see where these kids look at them and say, hey, I think this child would be good with playing the community on the community baseball league. Or I think this kid would be on the community basketball league. Or I think this kid will do good with music lessons. This child is really excelling in music. Hey, she needs voice lessons. Guess what? DHS can't pay for that for that child. That child can have the opportunity. If you th if you see anything that that child could excel in or help that child be better or help that child stay in school, it, it just costs a little bit of money. Hey, it won't talk to their casework. Say, hey, I've noticed that that uh, little Johnny likes drawing. And I know a lady who does uh, art classes and I think he'll really excel in that. That really helps him come out. Since he's been drawing these pictures, he's been turned into a whole different child. He's been a better person because he's been drawing. So if we can pinpoint him doing the uh, drawings and pinpoint him with doing things that he don't uh, he don't normally do, hey, let's do that. Taking some kids out of the norm. I have a I have custody of a seven year old and the teacher brought her daughter's violin in class. And just to see this child holding this violin, because I would never thought of violin. And because I'm not musically inclined at all. So to see this baby holding this violin and the teacher sending me videos of him playing violin, oh guess what? He's getting a violin. It's just simple things like that in um uh, I don't know if anybody here from Outer Burns, but I just love that school. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah, but the things that the teacher, small things that teachers can do, you never know. Just a simple word, just a simple saying, hey, I know to see good at basketball. Let's go out here and play basketball. Hey, you don't have basketball shoes. Hey, let somebody know. And one thing about, uh, we do have community people that will say, hey, if a child needs a basketball shoes, we, we, we probably can get that child basketball shoes. We probably can get that child, hey, you want a basketball? If it makes this child where he can have a better day and stay in school, let us know. It's probably something that we can do in order to help do it better. Let anybody, let the caseworker know, CASA advocates, mm -hmm. And I know we have a lot of CASA advocates that come to the school. They come with a court order saying that they allowed in these in, to get the child's records. They allowed to sit in the classroom because they are our CASA advocates. They are our extra eyes. Be nice to our advocates. They 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 come there. They don't come there to do anything but to be benefit what their child is. If you let them know, hey, I think little Billy would like to do this. I think Lil Billy would like to do that. That cost the advocate gonna put it in their report. They're gonna call their supervisor. They're gonna do something in order to build this child up. Cause our goal is to build the child, not to take do take anything away from it, not to pull anything away from the child. We want to build this child to where it can go and get that high school diploma and for this education on the college. And I know a lot of kids are not you know, college material, don't want to go to college, but there are other avenues out there, you know, that they can do and they can take upon and they can learn a trade and they can still make a good living for, for themselves. So when we, uh, 
look at these things and we see where our kids are going, we appreciate you teachers for what you do. Do anybody have any questions or anything? We do have a question in the chat. I, I wanna kind of put a, a plug in and follow up with what you said. You know, for a lot of our casework, for a lot of our kids in care, um, the caseworkers that are assigned to them, they have multiple, multiple cases with multiple, multiple children on it. Um, those caseworkers are, are that, that's their full-time job and they're, um, they're working with a lot of kids. At least I know in the 20th district there in Faulkner County, um, CASA advocates are only assigned to one case at a time. So if, if you've got a child who is in foster care and, and if you've met the advocate, if you've got that, that connection, just know that advocate has a more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that child. And so um, and I'm speaking to the educators in the room, you know, y'all could work with that um, CASA advocate because they are court appointed and they have the ability to, I mean, they're, they're commissioned to be able to see records and have those conversations. And it's more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So just, just a plug for that as well. Um, the question in the chat, one of the hardest things is when you notice a child who may be sneaking snacks or stealing, lying or doing things out of the ordinary and you need to reach out to the families, but they get offended or basically tell you to mind your own business because, you know, that what happens at home stays at home kind of thing. How can you handle or what can you do to help those students when you try to reach out to the families and they, they aren't interested in any kind of assistance? That is a hard situation again, because like I said, I, I've been there. I, I've dealt with it. And the thing about it, and that was actually one of the families that, two of the families that I did make the hotline call to. Because if you see a child that's um, getting snacks from home, you know, to take home and doing it, that is a, there is a need in that house that needs to be addressed. And just like I said, making that hotline call, it might not be, um, it, you might not have an open court case, but it might be that we can open that case to try to get that family some help. We can open that case and try to refer that family to a food bank. We can open that case and try to see what's going on to why that child, that, why that child feels that he has to take that food home. And again, I can't stress enough, like when you see stuff like that, make the call. Because you see that there is a need in that household. And if they won't listen to you come to them and say, hey, and they tell you to stay out their business, if they're not wanting outside people to come in, it is something going on in that household. And that is a big, big warning sign when they say, stay out my business. Because if somebody won't help, they're going to receive the help that they're trying, that they're trying to uh, get. And a lot of people cry because they don't they don't want DHS. So everybody look at DHS as being bad, but DHS have resources to help families. We're our goal, even if we remove our child, the first major goal that DHS have is reunification. We want to reunify that child with their family. We're not they don't DHS is not there to take to tear down situations. They're there to, to unify. And it might be a simple thing as taking that family to DHS to apply for food stamps. You know, that case, if it's a simple case, the simple case is not open no more than three months. If it's something simple like, hey, dad lost his job, we don't have the money no more, we, it's some, you know, funds have been short, and that might be a real proud family. But we want, they might just need something simple as a food stamp application, a food bank. They need a job referral. Hey, it might be something simple like that. Mom, single fam, parent family, mom that lost her job, you know, that's the only income because she's a single parent, no matter what she's doing to try to make ends meet, there are resources that we can put together to help that family to become, to stand strong for their own. And that's the thing where we are, we're here to help a family stand on their own. You know, uh, you know, it's, we have had, they are, they are good and bad case. We have had families that kids got removed and they were happy just for their week visits, you know, 
they living their best life and their kids in care. Those are situations. We come across those as well. But we have to look, we have to look for the ones, the parents that's gonna fight for these kids back. They're going to do what they got to do. They're going to fix their situation to get their kids back. So I am like this. If you see a need, you don't try to reach out to the family and the situation's still going on, make the call. I'd rather be safe than sorry. When, I, when I'm a real advocate on making these hotline calls because of the fact I didn't see so much have happened because people have turned their back. They turned... They turned into deaf, you know, they turned the deaf ear to the situation, praying to get better. I've seen teachers bathe kids, redress them just to keep from making the hotline call. They do everything they can to make sure that the kids not talked about at school. But when it comes down to it, the kids are still going home to a bad situation. So we try to fix it within these eight hours. But these kids got to go back home at 3.30. They got to go back to their house at 3.30. We don't know everything that child dealing with from the time that they are there because they, until they come back to school, we make the kids, teachers make the kids shiny so they can, so they can do that. But that child has to go back to that situation that we don't know what's going on in that situation. So it is, we have to make the call. Let's say we don't make the call and something happened to that child. You, you, come to school and this child does not show up at school the next day. They don't show up at school the day after that. They don't show up at school. And then you hear on the news that something happened to that child. That 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 right there, I probably would just break down and cry. You know, I, I probably couldn't function if I knew that a, something had happened to one of the kids that I was dealing with and I had a chance to make that call and I did. So, you know, if you make that call, hey, and I'm going to tell you this, if you make that hotline call and you still see the situation going on, make another hotline call. The situation still going on, make another hotline call. We got to learn to call until we get, we got to be consistent in what we're doing to protect our kids. These kids are our future. These kids don't, some kids, what they're dealing with, they don't deserve it. Kids don't ask to be brought here, but when they brought here, they deserve to live a life that they are comfortable with. So, I, you know, I know it's hard as an educator to make that call, and I know it's hard as an educator to get involved with a situation. And I, I can't, the hardest thing I ever, hardest call I ever had to make was over 20 years ago and it was a coworker who child was in my classroom and I tried to re help the coach, you know, but you eventually have to make that call because if something had happened to that child, I wouldn't have been able to live with myself and I had the opportunity to do something as simple as pick up the phone and make a phone call. So we never know what our kids are dealing with. So I would rather be safe and sorry. I'd rather for somebody to go knock on that person's door and sit down. Now, if they go, if we make the call, it's certain steps to making that call. Once you call that hotline number, the state police, with that's who you call when you make the hotline number. It's the Arkansas State Police. They will decide whether or not the call should be pushed to go to the investigator. Then it's sent to the investigator. If it passed the hotline call, it's sent to the investigator. The investigator depends on the nature of the call. We we'll either call the parents up to the office or go to the house to set up a meeting with them with their first call to see, hey, this is what the situation is. This is how it was. Now, if they get a high priority call, like the police make the call or something like that, they have to go, they have to jump in there right then and there. They have to jump in there. They have to go, go. when I say go, like wake up and run and go on to that call when it's a high priority call. But it's better to be safe than sorry. It's better to be safe than to look up and you don't see that child no more and you don't know what happened to that child. We have had a lot of people, once they know that the call been made on, pack up, move to another county pack up, move to another state, pack up, do this and pack up and do that. 
because the fact that they know that they doing something that they ain't not supposed to do. But people, most people won't help. You know, a lot of it's best for the kids because kids don't know. Kids love their parents. When I tell you children love their parents, regardless of any situation, they love their parents. I think the ones that have a difficult life love their parents more than, than the parents that give their kids everything. Because because like I said, my kids, they selfish sometimes. But like when, <laughs> when we got parents that, that uh, come in foster care, I know one woman, she was seriously drug addicted. But it's nothing that she could have done to stop her child from loving her. It's nothing that they can do because these kids love their parents. So we don't want to talk against their parents. We want to give the parents the skills they need to take care of their child and to give their child back that love that they deserve. That's our biggest goal. Now, when, like I was saying, it's a table for those of y'all that teach high school, junior high and high school, and I'm going to send, uh, I'm going to email Susan that table and it's the way you can say, hey, if this child needs a certain thing or this child do a certain thing, they ain't required. They can get taken care of. Like these kids can have, uh, if they want extracurricular activity, if you think your children need tutors, we can get that paid for. We can get children tutors. If they need art, art, thing, if you want to say, hey, this child, I believe they they will flourish if they play baseball. I believe this child do this. And if it's something as simple as they need shoes or if they need the gear to play in, that can be paid for. So just because they in foster care does not mean that they will do not, uh, they, can, they cannot participate in other things. They can participate. They can be able to do whatever other kids need to do. So that ties into the next question. She says, um, is it against the law for teachers to know if students are in foster care? No. I, I will, I, from the school standpoint, most counselors are the ones who deal with designations and might be the ones to know. I, I, would, I would dare say no one's gonna walk a child into a classroom and say, here, this is a foster care student. No, they're not gonna do that, but <laughs> that teacher can go, if you if you know something, that teacher can go uh, and say, hey, can you tell me about this child? When you got a new child, don't hesitate going to the council and say, hey, can you tell me about this child? You as teachers deal with these kids more than anybody else. And it does so, fall into the confidentiality piece that, you know, if we know something about our students, we do not disclose that to other people, so. Right, right, so it, but I think knowing that the child is in foster care, I think that's very important for the teacher to know because we know, because you will know, it's not for the teacher, you know, it's not for the teacher to know, to discuss it with another teacher. It's just for that teacher, that child's teacher to know so she know how to deal with this child. It's not like, okay, so you will notice something about the child because we have great foster parents but we do have some that 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 are that are kind of risky. So if you know the son, when we got a child in foster care and the child seems to be doing worse than it was doing when it was in its own home, that teacher needs to know. If you're dealing with this child every day, you need to know certain things about this child. You dealing with a child every day, even and it's not that you need to know like right off. But if you if a child come in your classroom. Most of the foster kids are not going to be the ones that come at the beginning of the school year. Foster kids, when they're taken out, they probably going to come in the middle of semester, in the middle of nine weeks. You never know. So if you got a child coming in and you see a child and you see this child is not, if it, this child not catching on like the normal kids, if this child is not socializing like everybody else, you might need to go ask questions like what's going on. They will answer your questions as a teacher of how you handle it and how you go about teaching this child. Each child learns differently. And I tell, I can't stress that enough. Each child learns differently. But when a child has trauma, it's more difficult for that child that's dealing with their trauma to learn. So you gotta know, you don't have to know why they in foster care. 
you don't have to know all that, but you do need to, yeah, I do believe the teacher do need to know, hey, I, I'm dealing with a child that, that has been removed from everything they know. I do believe that. And then um, kind of a follow-up, how do we find CASA advocates in our communities? And I'm gonna assume that maybe they're interested in knowing more about CASA advocates. Um, so how would they find that program in their local communities? Well, uh, actually you can Google it. If you are in a certain town, it should be an address that's located in that, in, you know, it should be an address to tell you where to go. Uh, it should be a contact information. We All our stuff is on Google. Facebook, each CASA program has a Facebook page. Uh, ours, have, ours have one. Go through there, find them. Hey, we love we we would love to know more and for you to learn more about Casa. We we as Casa would love to come in. All of us sit around and talk to to the teachers so you understand more about us. And also, um, I know there's a program locator on the Childhood Advocacy Center's page. I always get Children and Childhood. I never know which one it is, but the link that's in the chat. Um, they have like a, a program locator for different regions of the state right. and how it's served. Yeah, yeah. It, Arkansas um, is big because our and even with our CAC, which is our our child, what's it, our child advocacy center, have you know about how they go and how they interview when a child comes to care and their child has been abused or something has happened to their child. That's where our children go get interviewed. You know when they talk to somebody and. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing program. When I went out, I worked, like I said, I'm with CASA. But when I went over to the CAC and I seen everything they do, it is such an amazing thing. We all work together. But the, what they do and how they interview a kid and how they, and sometimes the interviews are difficult because, again, some of our kids will not disclose anything. They will not. So sometimes it might take two or three interviews just to get what we need out of there, you know, out of there. And uh, and one thing, if y'all see kids wearing long sleeves and coats in the summertime, something ain't right. They hiding something. So I know I have seen that. I seen a little boy walking down the street the other day and, they, and he had on a coat. So I pulled up and asked him, I said, you all right? I said, well, it's hot out here. Why you got your coat on? And he was like, uh, he said, it was raining. He said, it was raining this morning and I ain't have enough room in my backpack. So I had to put it on. But it's just, you know, that was an explanation. But it's just that I'm so, and my kids tell me my job has changed me because I look, I'm, I'm suspicious of everybody. I'm not, I try not to be suspicious of everybody, but I am concerned and it's certain things that you can't help but be concerned when you did when you're dealing with kids that and you know this and the uh news and the this Arkansas for the last few weeks of all these teachers and stuff that's being arrested for the uh the child pornography that scares me so yes we have to we have to pay attention to everything even our co-workers so we we have to pay, make sure that one our main goal, and I'm sure as a teacher, even though you are educating and teaching, our main goal is make sure our kids are safe. That's all the questions we had in the chat so far, or in the Q and A so far. If anyone has any um, questions, feel free to put them in for either Miss Terry or Miss Michelle. I think she's back with us too. Um, you've given us some really good information, and it's always. Um, it's always good to hear from an educator who has been in the classroom, but is now on the other side of the desk, as you referenced, um, because you have that perspective of both places. So that, that adds a richness to the conversation. Yes. And so that, that's, I mean, I always love, because like I was trying, I was telling somebody, I tried to have a desk job one time and it did work out for me. And I love working with kids. I love anything that I can do to help better work with kids. I would love to do that. So, you know, hey, if y'all have something, y'all want volunteers to come up to the school, we, we love stuff like that. <laughs> so we, anything like that, we love to do. And, you know, I, if, it, if this was an in-person thing, I was going, it was like a backpack uh, thing that I do as a, 
as a um, icebreaker. I put backpacks with rocks on, rocks in the backpack, because the fact is to feel is to feel the weight that the kids go through, that's going through stuff that that they dealing, and we got to think about that weight. We got to think if if a child is like, if a, you have a 14-year-old dealing with stuff that a 25 or 30 or 40-year-old hadn't even dealt with, that child's carrying that heavy, heavy load. So in a plus trying to go to school and get an education, we have to uh, notice just the different things about that. And we, we appreciate, like I said, we appreciate teachers. And I know a teacher wears several different hats from counselor to teacher to doctor, especially the elementary school teachers. They, they are some of everything. <laughs> so, but the high school teachers as well. But we just tried our best to make sure that our kids are safe. That's, that's just the main goal. And the safe touch that uh, Michelle do, we're trying to, even though she just worked with the smaller kids, we're going to try to do a program where we make videos for our older kids because it's a different arena with the safe touch with the second, with the junior high and high school kids. We are trying to make a program for them so that they will know, hey, it's not okay to keep secrets. It's not okay to, to do that. And a lot of kids, it's hurtful in the fact that some kids do disclose to their parents, but parents don't believe them all the time. When, they, when it's a boyfriend or when it's a uncle or something like that that's close to mom and the child tried to disclose hey somebody touched me and it didn't feel right uh if they did this and it didn't feel right guess what sometimes mom not gonna believe them because they they think that this person is is great and they not you know and i one thing i tell my anybody i work with about the leaving the kids with a boyfriend they just met two months ago that's not a, that is definitely out the question because, you know, it's coming up some stuff to me for us to be in this uh, new age, this new time that we in, this technical area, some stuff should not be going on. You know, we should, we have to start listening to our children. We have to start listening to the words they're saying. And even with my kids or social media, we have to keep track on what they're doing on social media. We have to keep an eye on what they're doing. We have to notice who they're talking to or what they, I'm a very nosy parent. And uh, that, and when I was a teacher, I was a very nosy teacher. I used to ask parents questions, hey, what's going on? Little Billy wore the same shirt yesterday as he did today. You know, it could be something as simple as, oh my God, I don't know, that's his favorite shirt. He wanted to put it back on today. It could be something that simple, but you got, you know, just that simple, say it in a joking way, you know, be serious, but say it in a way to be lighthearted, you know, with our parents, you know, sometimes we, we try to, you know, sometimes if you crack a joke and it all becomes down to the relationship that you have with your parents and your kids. If you are, have, if you are in the classroom and you have a good relationship with your students, they wouldn't mind coming and telling you stuff. They wouldn't mind you asking them questions because they know you got a good relationship with them. So I'm going to, uh, just to give anyone else a chance to put in um, questions, I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat um, a link to the web page. This is where the recording of today's session will be posted. Give me about a week to get it processed and up. And also together the extra documents from um, Michelle and Terry and get those up as well, the reading list and, and the, um, the list from Terry. So that's where you'll be able to find the recording in about a week. I always do a follow-up email to everyone who is registered and everyone who's attended and just let you know, hey, it's up and here's your certificate. So you'll know when it's, when it's up, but it, it does take me about a week. And then, of course, um, we would love any kind of feedback information that you can give us to help improve this session or future sessions. So that link is in the chat now as well. Um, it's just a quick six question uh, survey and we'd love some, some feedback from you. And then um, if you would like to be on the mailing list, the website that I first posted has a list of upcoming trainings. You know, I kind of update it for the few, a few weeks out. But um, I also do an email mailing list that goes out twice a month. 
about twice a month unless I make a mistake and have to follow up and clean it up. Um, and you can sign up for that uh, mailing list at the link that's in the chat now. And for certificates, these are all the things that we put in before. If you need a certificate for today and you um, came into this webinar in some other way than besides ESC works and our educators know what that is, and that's our registration system. But if you um, not register through ESC Works and you need a certificate, please feel free to, um, to send me an email and I will get it for you. And I don't see any other questions coming in through the chat or through um, the Q&A. So uh, I'll open it up and ladies, do you have any, any last minute comments for our group as we wrap up? I appreciate everyone's time to our, our participants. Can I, can I say something? Even That's if the, the teachers do not want to be cost and advocates, we do have different events throughout the year for the uh, the CAC and the CASA program. If y'all just want to volunteer, if you see something on Facebook and you say, hey, I'm, I might be interested in just volunteering. We love community volunteers. We love people to come out and just, you know, if you just volunteer because that, that, that right there just brings a different look. And if we you're doing something and we have an event for our kids and our kids see you there, hey, that'll bring a smile to their face. So if you if you got the time when you see something posted that Casa's finna do or an event Casa finna do, hey, be free, be, be, we want you to come out and volunteer and, and just be there and join us. If you just want to come out and participate, we would love to have you there. Um, and one thing I didn't think about. Every school district has a foster care liaison in their district that is um, meant to ha help work with students in the foster care system and help facilitate back and forth with DCFS. So for the person who asks, is it, you know, is it legal for us to know who's in foster care? If you have concerns or if you'd just like to visit with that foster care liaison, I would encourage you to find them in your district and just have a conversation. What, because while it may not be a state law or anything like that, there could be district policies that would affect that. So um, if you have questions about maybe the foster care process and how it looks in your district, um, I would encourage y'all to find that person locally and, and have those conversations as well. And a lot of them, um, this the link for today was sent out through that office. So we may actually have a lot of those foster care liaisons in here with us today. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, ladies, so much. I appreciate thank you. you doing a great job. And I value the, your time and your information to help our educators and to help build this network of support for our kids. So thank you, everyone. Watch thank you for having me. And thank you.